Hey, Samson, how's it going? It's good, it's good. Yeah, it was pretty hot earlier today. Like I went out for lunch and then um, I went back to my office and then now it's now it's gloomy. Um, but it's good. I was just talking to Dr. Lee and we were saying that we, we need some rain because it's uh, it's been a while since we've had some rain here. So hopefully, hopefully it rains. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Yeah, <laughs> it's the uh, after midterm effect. <laughs>
All right, it's uh, four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone? How's everyone feeling today? Good. Yeah. It's uh, for those of you on Zoom, you can't see. There's uh, there's two people here in the class, so uh, a little a little bit of empty help. So uh, I guess we kind of saw the extreme. So last last Wednesday, everyone's here, which was great. You know, I got to see all of you for the um, for many of you for the first time ever, and then now it's empty. But I guess that's how that's how things go. Okay. Uh, so speaking of the midterm, I'm, uh, I, I did start grading it today. Uh, I'm not quite done yet, and so, uh, but I only have like five more left, and so I think I should be, um, I should be finished by tomorrow morning. Uh, how are the scores so far? So I, I don't want to comment on that until, um, until Wednesday, and so um, I'd rather, you know, I'd finish everything, and then we can all just talk about it. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and so, you know, on Wednesday, I'll have, uh, I'll be passing back the exams, and so uh, you'll be you'll be able to see your score on on Canvas uh, for sure. Uh, but if you want to see my feedback and and the comments that I wrote on your exam, you have to come either pick it up in person um, in the classroom, or you can come to my office during office hours and pick it up there. And so uh, right now, I, I don't have any plan to scan uh, the midterms just because that would be kind of crazy uh, with how many uh, with how many um, people are in the class and, and how many pages there are, but. Uh, but if, you, if but if there is kind of a, a extenuating circumstance, then um, I will I, I can do that for for those circumstances. But I would per, I would prefer that you come either to the class or or come to my office to pick it up after the exams are scored. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and so the plan for today is we have a little bit of the lecture notes on joint biomechanics left, and so we have to talk just mostly about uh, joint injuries and joint lubrication. Okay. And so we're going to finish talking about that. And then we're going to be moving on into the the next part of the class, which is, um, you know, we're going to go over basically each part of the body individually. And so we're going to start with the upper extremity, which is your shoulder, your arms, and your your hands and your wrist. And then we're going to be learning a new technique called um, static um, biomechanical analysis. So I, I guess it's not really a new technique. It's you know a technique that you know hopefully everyone should know, which is you know static analysis of structure. Uh, but we're going to be applying it towards biomechanical systems. To determine things like you know how much force your muscles are exerting and how much um, how many for, how much forces are being placed on your joints. Okay, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of these a lot of these calculations um, are kind of core to you know uh, first of all you know just designing um, just any kind of engineering device that interacts with these body parts, uh, but also in like um, in things like sports medicine and things like you know kinesiology um, and designing exercises and, and things like that. Okay. Uh, okay, um, so are there any questions I can answer before we uh, get started? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get and get rolling. Okay. All right, and so uh, last time, uh, you know, last Monday, about a week ago, we were talking about joint flexibility, right? Uh, and, the, and the idea with joint flexibility is that, you know, it kind of describes how much range of motion that you have at the joints. Okay? Uh, and so the last two topics that, you know, I want to go over uh, in terms of joints is, uh, first of all, you know, what are some common injuries that you can have at your at your joints? And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about how joints are lubricated. Okay. So let's start with injuries.
right? And so just like we did with the bones and the muscles where we talked about, you know, different ways that you can hurt them and, and different injury concerns, we're gonna do that for the joints as well, okay? And so probably the most common uh, or one of the most common injuries you can get at your joints is a sprain. And so this is different from a strain, which we went over in muscles. So it sounds similar, but they are different. And so a sprain is, uh, these are caused by any abnormal displacement or twisting um, of the bones. Um, and ultimately what it's gonna do is it's gonna cause damage to the ligaments surrounding the bones, okay? Okay. And so any damage to the, to the soft tissue around the joint, uh, which is not the muscles, uh, we consider those a sprain. Okay. Uh, and so technically, you know, any, anything in terms of like ligaments or tendons or any other, you know, any other connective soft tissue around there, those all consider, uh, are considered as sprains, uh, but probably ligament injuries are probably among the most common. Okay. And so one particular, you know, ligament that gets hurt a lot or one particular joint that gets is susceptible to sprains are your ankles, okay? Okay. Uh, and in particular, there you're um, you're much more likely to get sprains on the lateral side. Remember that's the that's the outside of your that's the outside side of your of your foot. Okay? okay, and there's a couple of reasons for this. And so you know the the uh, probably the main reason is that there's um, you know a lack of ligament support on that side. Okay. Question in the chat. Let's see. Oops. All right. So, how is that different from sprains to soft muscles? Yeah. So, um, any uh, any injury to a muscle is is normally characterized as a strain. Um, and so, muscles, you know, because they're um, you know they have that contractile component to them, so they're they're kind of structured a little bit differently. Whereas your ligaments and your tendons, those are those are literally just connective tissue. And so, uh, your 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 body doesn't have any control over the ligaments and tendons. And so, you know, the way that they, they get injured is a little bit different. Um, you know, um, I think the, the biggest difference is that strains are usually a little bit easier for your body to heal because your muscles just kind of just necessarily have a lot of blood vessels that go towards them, right? Um, and so, um, you know, because of that, you're, uh, anytime you damage your muscles, you know, it's a lot easier for your body to go in and, and repair it because of because how much it's, it's vascularized. But for your ligaments and tendons, your um, these tissues in your body often don't have that many blood vessels that go towards them. And so any damage to a ligament or a tendon is, is usually a little bit harder for your body to heal just because there, it just has no way to really access it. Yeah. And so that's, I'd say that's kind of the main difference why they, they differentiate between the two. Uh, and sprains, um, you know, they can also be, they can be characterized as either first degree, second degree, second degree, or third degree, depending on the severity. And so sprains can range anywhere from just a simple stretching of the ligament or stretching of the, um, of the soft tissue to a complete tear. And so, you know, there's, there's different, there's different levels to this too.
Okay. All right, and so sprains, you know, any uh, basically any damage to um, any of the connective tissue. Okay. All right, and so the 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 next type of um, injury that's common at the joints is dislocations. Uh, and so dislocation is uh, basically any time one of the articulating bones at a joint uh, pops out of the of the socket, basically. And so if it's put into a position where it's no longer articulating, you know, it's adjacent bone, then that's considered a, a dislocation, okay? All right, and so the common places where you can have dislocations are the shoulder. Okay. Remember we talked about the shoulder is a very, it's a very flexible joint because your shoulder can, can achieve, you know, lots of different ranges of motion, uh, but it's actually, uh, but that flexibility comes with it an increased risk of dislocations, okay? And so if you looked at the if you looked at the anatomy of the shoulder, it's actually kind of a uh, like your your upper arm bone, which is your humerus, has a little bit of, of a spherical head. And so that fits into a, it's ideally in order for it to be a true ball and socket, it should fit into a kind of a nice socket that surrounds it. But if you look at the, the, the scapula where it inserts in, it's actually just a small groove. And so this your your humerus head is actually kind of sliding along that groove quite a bit. And so, you know, relative to other joints of your body, it's actually pretty unstable, but that's kind of what you do all the all the nice things to your shoulder. Okay. Uh, some other common locations are your fingers. Yeah, and some people can uh, uh, can uh, pop pop it in, pop it out <laughs> at, at will, which is uh, kind of gross to me, but it's uh, but people can do that. Okay. Uh, your knees and your elbows too. Uh, question. Oh, yes, yes, that was a typo. So yeah, it's when one of your articulating bones pops out of the, of the joint, not the joints. Okay. okay. Right. And so a dislocation, um, you know, it's, uh, it can cause a lot of damage. And so obviously some damage that can occur is that, you know, when the bone pops out, that can also cause, you know, sprains because it's going to damage the, the connective tissue. Uh, but it can also cause damage to, um, you know, any of the surrounding nerves or blood vessels in the area too. Okay? Uh, and so whenever you do have a dislocation, you know, it, it's, it's best to not leave it like that. You should, you should pop it back in. Um, but, you know, you should, most of the time you should leave that to a medical professional because if you don't pop the joint in kind of in the correct way, you can kind of, you know, injure yourself even more. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right, so the third type of common injury at a joint is called bursitis. Okay. Um, and so we didn't, we didn't really go over bursa, what bursa are, but bursa are these almost like fluid filled sacs um, that, that, uh, um, that act as cushions at the joints. Okay. Right? And they soften and they soften impacts between muscles, tendons, and bones. Okay. And so all kind of all three of them. Okay. And so anywhere you, where you have kind of constant contact between bones and muscles and tendons, you know, your, your body sometimes develops these bursa in order to uh, in order to cushion those, uh, those impacts. Okay. 
Um, but you know what can happen sometimes is that these bursa can become uh, inflamed, okay, uh, which can cause pain uh, with movement. Okay, and so a lot of times uh, bursitis is often caused by you know lots of repeated lots of repeated um, movements uh, and agitation to the bursa. Okay. Okay. All right. And so that's bursitis. And so the last injury that I want to go over is uh, arthritis. So arthritis is probably a term that, that most people have heard of. Okay. And uh, what it is, is this is just basically a general term for any kind of inflammation at the joints. And there's actually different kinds of arthritis out there. A, a little bit of a medical terminology uh, trivia. So whenever whenever you see a condition that ends in itis, right? and so this is this is a uh, an ending that's very common in medical terminology. Whenever you see something ending in itis, it means some kind of inflammation in some way. Um, and so, um, you know, um, you know, I think it's used for a lot of uh, a lot of medical terms. So, you know, that's why that's why we have these both of these ending in itis because they both refer to inflammation. Okay. All right. So, arthritis is um, extremely common, and so usually when uh, as people age, they they tend to develop arthritis. Uh, and there's lots of different types of arthritis out there, but uh, I do want to go over two of the most, two of the more common ones. Okay. And so the first, uh, the first type of arthritis uh, I want to go over is rheumatoid arthritis. And so this is a, actually it's, it's an autoimmune disorder. And so basically it's a disorder with your immune system. Okay. Uh, and it's a, dis, it's a disorder where the body's immune system actually attacks the tissue at the joint. And so the body seems to think that the um, that the um, you know the tissue at the joint is a some kind of um, external invader, and so it'll send actually you know antibodies and stuff to actually fight against it, which um, you know the joint obviously doesn't like. Right, and the other common type of arthritis that's out there is osteoarthritis. And so this is a, a degenerative condition uh, where the arterial cartilage actually wears down with time. Okay. 
because a lot of your a lot of your joints are covered in this um, articular cartilage, right? And so when that starts to wear down with time, then your um, then all the impacts that your body sustains will cause the um, joints to become inflamed. And so the exact cause of osteoarthritis is, is unknown, um, but some theories exist out there where they, they try to link it with the frequency and magnitude um, of the loading that the joint undergoes and also the type of occupation. Okay? But largely it's, it's unknown. Right. And so again, you know, notice, notice the similarities in this, uh, uh, in this term compared to osteoporosis, which is another condition that we went over earlier, right? So notice that it has a similar osteo. Right? And so if you remember osteoporosis was a degenerative disease where your body uh, or the, where the bones in your body, you know, kind of degenerates in terms of the, the, min the mineral content and the strength of the bones, right? Um, but in that case, you know, we call it osteoporosis because it was a, you know, a, a condition for the bones and how porous they are, right? But here we have osteoarthritis where this is where, you know, the, the, the tissue and the cartilage in your joints, that's actually breaking down over time, right? And so um, I, know, I know a lot of, um, you know, a lot of medical terms might seem a little bit scary, but there are some similarities between them if you kind of, you know, draw their, uh, um, you know, draw the connections like this. All right, any questions? Yeah. So this osteo just means the loss of tissue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a general term for loss of, some, loss of something uh, with time. All right, question. So do we have an understanding of what causes rheumatoid arthritis uh, as in what causes the immune system to react that way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't... I don't know if the, the exact cause for that has been uh, explored either. I know, I know there's been some treatments and drugs that can help uh, prevent that. Uh, because it is an, an autoimmune disorder, um, that's a little bit easier to control because you can kind of you know, take medicines and take drugs to kind of trick your body into not doing those, those kinds of things. Um, but in terms of an exact cause, I'm, I'm not sure if they found it. Yeah, but I think mostly it's treated, the, the symptoms can be treated you know, fairly effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you said that osteoarthritis will cause the inflammation that you said that there's things that kind of something to do with sports or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So do we see, like in the general population, do we see higher amounts of osteoarthritis in people like, I don't know, like people who do scaffolding or like woodworkers or, you know, pipe fitters, like skilled laborers like that, mm -hmm. who like put, you know, a large amount of force on their the same joint daily, whether that be like their elbow from hammering or, or whatever. And then also like people that do a specialized type of weightlifting, like uh, like Olympic weightlifting, for example, they do the same two movements probably like, you know, six days a week. So do we see higher levels of arthritis and people like that than we do in the general population? Yeah. Yeah. So gen generally, yeah. And so they, uh, they've, they've found correlations with, you know, just uh, for, for certain occupations which load joints more, more often than others, then those tend to develop more osteoarthritis just because you're putting just more wear and tear on those, on those joints compared to you know, other people. Um, the exact, uh, I think it'd be really interesting to look at the exact numbers, but I, I just kind of know just that's just the general trend that, that, people, uh, that people observe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, think it's, I think part of the, part of the difficulty is that it's because it's such a long-term condition, it's really difficult to model with like any kind of computational model. And so it's, you just have kind of just, you know, um, indirect observations and we can correlate it with certain things, but um, you know, you know the saying like correlations, not causation. And so, you know, there, there's been correlations that have been found, but you know, what exactly causes it is I think still being researched. Yeah, I guess like, you know, that's interesting because I guess if you got like, you know, construction workers, whatever, that were in their sixties or fifties and they had arthritis, we don't know what they were exposed to, you know, in their 50 years of life that could have potentially caused that issue. It might not even be the work that they did. Exactly. Years, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's so there's there's so there's so many different factors that can influence these things. So 
you know, they like, like statisticians and doctors, they try to draw correlations, but nothing is really definitive until there's like an actual mechanistic cause and you know, you can prove that. Yeah. All right, uh, any other questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so let's talk a bit about uh, joint lubrication. All right, and so joint lubrication is, is really important because you know, your joints are basically the, the parts of your body which connect you know, connect all the different limbs, right? And so just like if, if you think about a mechanical device, right? anytime you have a mechanical device where you have moving parts and the moving parts come into contact with each other, you need to have good lubrication at those parts in order to make sure your machine works effectively, right? And so it's the same thing for your body. Okay. Right. Uh, in order to make body movement efficient and to also reduce uh, wear and tear. Okay. And so the, the main way that the body does this is through um, a layer of cartilage. Okay. And so if you look at, you know, a typical joint, so let's say that we have two bones coming in. Okay, so we'll call this bone one. And it's coming into contact with bone number two. Okay. Uh, and so covering this joint or covering each of the bones, you have a layer of, of cartilage that kind of acts as almost like a pad, almost like a shield. Right? And so these would be the cartilage. And actually surrounding a lot of joints is you can, uh, um, you can almost draw almost like a capsule around it. Okay. And then to add further lubrication inside this, this joint capsule is a type of fluid called synovial fluid. All right, and so the card, the let's, let's talk about the cartilage just for a second. Okay. So the cartilage, um, you know, it has two main two main roles. And so the first the first role is is simply that you know because they form this uh, protective covering around the bones. It actually increases the it increases kind of the surface area of, of contact, right? And so that's important because you know the larger surface area that you have, any kinds of forces or any kind of impacts that the joint um, sustains, it spreads those forces out over a larger area. Because uh, what you want to do is that, you know, by spreading out the, the loads over a large area, you kind of reduce the peak force or the peak stresses that any one point can, um, can stay. And so that's the first role, okay? 
Uh, and the second role um, has to do with the fact that uh, cartilage usually is very smooth in, uh, in, in, its, uh, uh, in its texture, right? And so the smooth texture of the, uh, of the cartilage basically allows them to move past each other with very minimal friction. And that's really important because uh, you know um, friction basically represents um, you know basically represents a loss of energy um, and movement in terms of heat. Right? And so you rub two surfaces together and they're frictional. Part of that energy or part of that kinetic energy that goes into you know rubbing them actually gets lost to heat due to friction. Right? And so just from a just from an efficiency standpoint, you know reducing friction is you know, something that's really important. Uh, but it's also but reducing friction is also important for um, you know, um, ensuring the longevity of, of the joint as well, right? Because another thing that's associated with friction are, you know, the shear stresses that, um, that friction undergoes, right? And so the more friction that you have between moving surfaces, the more frictional forces that you're going to have as well, then that's going to wear down your joint or wear down, you know, the surfaces more, more often, right? And so the less friction that you have, you know, the less wear and tear that the, the joints are going to undergo, and the longer it's going to last without, you know, without undergoing something like osteoarthritis or, or bursitis or things like that. Okay. All right. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this so far? Yeah. So finding or in terms of like implant technology, have we already come up with like a good enough, uh, like good enough materials? That can reduce friction to the point of like our natural, uh, our natural uh, joints, or is that still a big area of development in terms of like implant technology, like knees and elbows and stuff? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think in terms of just pure frictional qualities, I, I think we're there. I think, uh, and I think they use a lot of that technology for like you know like aerospace stuff and and other applications. I think the difficult, the the main difficulty with any kind of implantable device is getting your body not to attack. Um, and so that's, um, and so that's true. Uh, that's true for the joints here, but it's also true for like, um, uh, for any kind of fake blood vessels. I know that's, a, that's a big issue. And so we can, we can, we can already make materials that mimic the material properties of a blood vessel. Okay. The problem is that, uh, you know, when you put that in a lot of people, the body thinks it's something foreign and it, it'll try to attack it and it will kind of, you know, defeat the purpose of that. Of that step. So I think, I think that's the main difficulty, I think with, uh, uh with implant devices right now. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, any other questions on uh, on this? Okay. All right. And so when uh, when a joint is when a joint is loaded, um, the cartilage, you know, it basically acts as a cushion. All right. Oh, question. So what is the tolerance scale between joints? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah. That that I'd have to look up. Um, you know, that I'd have to research a little bit more before I I, I let you guys know, but. Um, I think I think it depends on the joint, um, and so I think different uh, joints have different uh, different tolerances, uh, just because each of the joints uh, are sustained or um, you know sustained different amounts of load. And so actually, you know, if you look at if you look at a lot of the joints in your body, the amount of cartilage that's there is is actually different between them too, um, just because you know different joints are going to sustain different loads. But in terms of tolerances, you know, I, I'd have to look into that a bit more before I, I comment on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and so when, uh, when you load the joint, uh, the cartilage basically acts like a cushion. So it, it deforms a little bit, and so it depresses. Okay? And when it depresses, it actually secretes this, uh, this uh, synovial fluid, uh, which acts both as a lubricant and, and as a damper. Okay? Okay.
Okay. And so, you know, to, just to draw kind of a simple image. So let's say that we have a bone surface like this. Okay. We have the uh, piece of cartilage just like like that. Okay. A very rough picture. You know, it doesn't it doesn't look that uh, like like that usually. Okay. And so when a, when a load comes in, and so let's say that you know this joint is being loaded, where the adjacent bone is going to be basically contacting this joint like this. Okay. And so we have basically a force that pushes it like that. This, uh, this, um, the cartilage is, is going to deform a little bit. And so cartilage is, is compared to bone, is, is fairly flexible. Right? And so it's going to, you know, kind of um, cushion the load like that. Right. right? And then in its place, uh, or, or, you know, as it deforms, it's also going to secrete this, um, you know, synovial fluid that comes out. Right? And that synovial fluid is going to get basically in between. Uh, in between the two, the two things that are contacting to make sure that there it minimizes the amount of friction as, as much as possible. Okay. Okay. And so let's let's talk about you know what effects the synovial fluid kind of actually has on the motion between between the bones. Okay. You know because because it is a fluid, it, it actually has you know um, different different effects depending on how quickly you know the bones are acting towards each other. And so this gets in, a little bit into lubrication theory. And so if you take a graduate fluids class, um, I know I know for sure we covered this in EGME 520. You know, then we then we talk about lubrication. So this gets a little bit into that, but but not but not too. Deep. Hopefully, hopefully it's pretty intuitive. Okay? All right. And so there's two basically there's basically two regimes that I want to talk about. Okay? And so the first regime that I want to talk about is when the joint is being loaded at a slow uh, at a slow rate. And so when you load the joint at a slow rate, um, then you know this, the the synovial fluid actually isn't really doing all that much. And so basically, you're it's going to be pushing into the fluid, uh, but really, you know, uh, at the slow rate, the cartilage itself is going to be the one that that dampens the load. I think I think the uh, the most clear analogy of this is you know think of think of um, you know uh, think of uh, you know if you're standing inside a swimming pool right or any kind of large body of water if you take your hand and you try to move it slowly through the water right then the water's not really going to give you much resistance because you're 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 uh, you're deforming it at a very slow rate and so the amount of um, drag force that's on your hand is very very minimal right and so it's the same thing for joints too okay and so if you're loading your joints very slowly. You know, then the cartilage, you know, then the synovial fluid is not really going to be doing much to dampen that load, and the cartilage is going to be handling handling most of that. But on the on the other hand, if you if you load your joint very suddenly and very quickly, then the synovial fluid will will do a lot to kind of cushion that load right? because because it is a fluid. And that and that's kind of the the basis for, for how modern lubrication works. And so, 
you know, lubrication works, um, you know, especially well when you have a high amount of shear or a high amount of motion in between the, the moving parts, okay? Because uh, at, at low shear rates, you know, fluid doesn't actually do, do all that much to you. Uh, but it's only at higher shear rates and higher motion that um, you know, fluid can actually work to lubricate stuff, okay? All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, a couple, a couple more um, kind of trivia facts about cartilage, and then we'll uh, we'll move on to the next the next thing. Okay, um, and so if you if you're curious about you know the the, the magnitude of the effect that cartilage can have, um, and so the cartilage itself can reduce contact stresses by fifty percent or more. As I, as, and as you can imagine, you know that's that's a huge reduction because if that if that um, stress is being placed on your bones, you know that's going to cause a lot of damage, especially if it's something that you're doing you know pretty regularly. Okay, and the amount of friction that you get is actually you know really really small in there too, right? And so friction can be reduced down to about seventeen to thirty three percent of the friction that's between an ice skate and ice. Okay, and so that's that's pretty small. Right, so your body has a has actually a pretty good mechanism going, and and you know you can test this for yourself. So kind of move if you move kind of your your limbs around, right? You don't really feel any of the, the friction in there, right? So all the all the strain that you usually feel is usually from your muscles that go into moving, actually producing that motion. But at the joint itself, you know, especially especially for younger people, right? You don't feel any of that wear. You don't feel any of that friction. So it all just kind of glides really really smoothly. Yep. Do we know that cartilage? Ah. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I so I got this number from from the textbook, um, but I don't. But I don't know if it's uh, if they've actually compared it to other stuff and actually computed, you know, what that coefficient is. I, I imagine it's it's really small because I know that you know between an ice skate and ice, it's it's um, that's like you know like less than like zero point zero one. I, I want to say less than that. And so you know, if this is a lot less than that, it's 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 really small, but. Uh, I'm sure there are papers. I'm sure there's research papers out there that that quantify it for different joints in your body, uh, but I but I'm not sure what they are off the top of my head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. What else is here? Okay. Uh, so another another important point about cartilage is that it's largely avascular. And so what that means is that there's there's hardly any blood vessels that run through run through your cartilage. And so what this means is that, you know, if, if your cartilage um, ever gets um, injured or damaged, it's actually really difficult for the body to heal it because your blood vessels are kind of the main, um, the main way that your body goes and heals different tissues in your body. And so for a lot of people, you know, if you do, um, 
get any kind of damage or any kind of injury to the cartilage in your uh, in your joints, you know, they tend to actually get worse with time, right? And so for a lot of other injuries, like injuries to your bones or injuries to your muscles, right? Usually if you rest it for a while, then your body will, will kind of heal it on, on its own, you know, with enough time. Um, but with your joints, you know, because they don't have that many blood vessels going to them, any injury or any kind of, um, you know, damage to them just tends to get worse with time. And so, you know, it, it can be something that's, um, that can be pretty bad if, you're, if your body does get an issue. Okay. All right. Uh, and it's also important to note that, um, you know, the exact mechanisms through which, you know, synovial fluid and cartilage reduce friction and wear is an ongoing area of research. Right? Um, and so, you know, particularly, you know, the, the, the correlation between um, wear and damage and friction is, is still being researched because right now the, the research data isn't completely clear. Okay. Um, because there's, there's been a lot of cases where, um, you know, um, doctors and scientists have looked at a particular joint and the friction, the amount of friction that's there is actually really, really low, you know, just based on the synovial fluid and based on the measurements that they've taken. But they've also seen a lot of wear and a lot of damage on these joints too. And so, you know, um, it's one of those things where it's, it's kind of difficult to get exact data for it because it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a function of so many different things of a person's lifestyle and, and, and you know, everything like that. And so it's still, you know, being researched. Uh, but at least, you know, at this point, we have a decent grasp of kind of the mechanical uh, effects of synovial fluid in terms of how it reduces friction, but how that actually translates to, you know, wear and tear on a person's body and their joints is still, is still being researched. All right, any, uh, uh, any last questions on joints before we move on to upper extremity stuff? Okay, all right, and so that, that closes out, I think um, the first, you know, the first big unit that we have in this class, which was bones, muscles, and joints, right? And so, you know, we've talked about, you know, the, all of these tissues in general, uh, I think that, and so now is the time to really start talking about different parts of the body in general, okay? And so now that we've understand all these things, you know, we're ready to talk about the arms and the shoulders and how do, you know, each of these um, parts of the body, you know, what kinds of forces they experience, you know, what kinds of devices that can be designed for, for these things. Okay, so for over the next few weeks, you know, we'll be going through the, um, this week we're starting the upper extremity, then next week we're going to do the lower extremity, which is your legs and your hips, okay? And then in the last one, we're going to do your, um, the biomechanics of your spine, which is going to be, you know, your lower back and your spine and, and all the weight and balance that comes according to that. Okay? All right, so let me go ahead and share my uh, screen. Okay, so does everyone see the, uh, the PowerPoint? Let me go ahead and start this. Right, can everyone still see the, uh, the slides here on Zoom? I never know, I never know if it's actually gonna work on, on Zoom. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, and so let's go ahead and start talking about the upper extremity, okay? And so here are the learning objectives, which we're, uh, you know, we're just gonna go over, you know, I showed, I showed the most important one of these at the beginning, okay? Uh, but basically, you know, these, um, these next few weeks are going to be, you know, I, I have these sets of lecture notes broken down into uh, parts A and parts B, okay? And so parts, uh, part A is going to be a, a PowerPoint presentation, which basically shows you all, you know, I, I would say all of the biological information that's needed for these, uh, for these parts of the body, right? And so we're going to go over the names of the bones, the names of the muscles, the names of the joints. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, common injuries for, for these parts of the, of the body, okay? Um, then I also have handwritten notes uh, in which we actually do some, um, some calculations on how do we compute things like muscle forces, things like joint loads, you know, um, under different kinds of loading situations. Okay? And so I think for today, I think we'll probably just be able to get done with the part A of the notes. And then on uh, Wednesday, you know, we'll, act, we'll actually start to do some calculations, which is, you know, I think, I think exciting because, you know, we've gone seven weeks in this class, mostly just uh, learning um, concepts and, and anatomy. So, I think this will be the first time in this class where we actually put that knowledge to, uh, to do actually some calculations. 
Okay, and so let's do let's let's introduce the upper extremity first, right? Um, and so you know, just uh, as introduction, you know, we've covered all those things in general. Okay, um, and so you know, we're going to start this unit by talking about the upper extremity, right? Which consists of your shoulder, it consists of your elbow, your wrist, and your hands. Okay, and so what's unique about this this part of the body uh, compared to your other parts is that they're mostly responsible with how we handle objects. Um, and so contrary to your legs and contrary to your, uh, to your spine, you know, your arms do very little, uh, very little load bearing. Okay. And so, you know, if you, if you compare, you know, the size of the muscles, the size of the bones in your, you know, in your upper extremity compared to other parts of your body, you'll see that they're really small in comparison, right? Um, and so things like if you compare the size of your bicep compared to your hamstring, right? And so those, those produce kind of a similar motion. Where your bicep produces, you know, uh, flexion of your arm, the hamstring is, is responsible for flexion of your knee, right? Your hamstring is way bigger than your uh, than your biceps in, in most cases, right? Um, except for the dude that skipped leg day, you know. For most piece, for most people, uh, you know, your hamstrings are going to be a lot bigger, right? Um, but um, you know, what's unique about the upper extremity is that they're capable of of a wide, much wider range of motion and and control, also, right? Um, and so if you compare like your shoulder joint compared to your hip joint, you know, your shoulder joint, like we talked about, is extremely loose, right? And so it allows kind of such a huge, you know, range of motion, you know, but because of that, it also carries a greater risk of injury as well, okay? And if you think about your, your wrist and your fingers, you know, you can, you can do very, very dexterous, very, very fine movements with your hands compared to your feet, right? And so your hands, if you think about it, they're responsible for really fine movements like, you know, like writing your notes or even performing surgery on, on a person, right? Which, is, which requires a ton of dexterity and a ton of coordination, right? And so you don't have that kind of coordination in other parts of your body. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of what sets the upper extremity apart from, uh, from the other one, okay? All right. Um, any questions on any of this so far before we start um, talking about the bones of the upper extremity? Okay, so let's start talking about the, the bones, okay? And so this is, this is when we will actually start talking about, you know, the actual names of, of all the bones. So up to this point, you know, we've, we've talked just about just uh, in general anatomy, but, you know, now that we're gonna be focusing on different parts of the body, it's important to know who the important actors are, okay? All right, and so, you know, uh, can everyone see my, my mouse? Okay, and so let's start with the clavicle, right? And so the clavicle, this is basically your bone that connects um, the sternum to the shoulder, right? and so it goes from the middle of your ribs over to your shoulder. Okay, and actually, you, you can actually feel your clavicle. So actually, if you kind of feel kind of right under your neck, that one bone that that seems kind of exposed right there is your is your clavicle. Right? And so that kind of runs right from your ribs to your shoulder. Okay? And so you know, actually, your clavicle is is very it's very common to to fracture because it's so exposed. It has very little kind of fat or any kind of uh, muscle tissue there to protect it. And so. Any kind of impact to your upper chest, you know, right before you, right below your neck, is going to draw a huge risk to uh, to the fracture of this bone because it, it's it's pretty small, it's pretty slender, and it's and it's super exposed, and so you know, it's it's injured fairly commonly. All right, and so the next bone that we're going to cover is your scapula, right? And so your scapula, it's it's a little bit hard to see from this image, but your scapula is kind of this bone that kind of forms your the shoulder blade. And so when you talk about your shoulder blade, you're often talking about your scapula, which is this kind of like um, very thin uh, flat bone in the back, right? Um, and so, um, you know, the, the scapula is a really important bone because first of all, it has a small cavity, right? And so if you look at this, uh, this part where the, where the scapula attaches to the humerus, right? It has kind of this little cavity for where, you know, um, it kind of forms the socket of your shoulder ball and socket, okay? Uh, but of course, it's a very shallow socket, right? And so you can see that, you know, the, 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 uh, the head of the humerus here is pretty big, uh, but where it actually fits in is, is fairly shallow, okay? Uh, and we'll talk later too that, you know, your scapula is very wide. And so a lot of muscles actually attach to the scapula because it has such a wide surface area. Um, and so, you know, part of the reason you can have such complex movement of your, of your shoulder, right? You can kind of pull it in all different directions is because the scapula kind of gives you a very wide, you know, a very wide base, a very wide area for lots of different muscles to attach to. Okay. All right, and so next we have the humerus, okay? And so the humerus is this, this long bone here, okay? 
Okay, and so this is the basically the, the singular bone of your um, of your um, of your upper arm. Okay, and so it's thicker it's thicker than all the other arms. Okay? Um, and the its most defining characteristic is its spherical head. Right? And so if you look at the uh, the head of the humerus, you know that's what inserts into your scapula, um, and that's what forms the ball of your ball and socket. And then from there we have the two the two bones of your forearm, and so we have the radius, which is the smaller bone, and then the ulna, which is the bigger bone. Okay? So you can see them labeled here. So here is the radius, okay? and here is the ulna. Okay. And so these two bones are different in that the ulna has a flatter top, it has a flatter top near your elbow. Okay. And so your elbow joint is actually formed mostly with the ulna because it has a flatter joint up there while your radius has a wider flatter top near your wrist okay and so at your wrist you have more of a connection between the radius and your hand bones where at your elbow you have a more of a connection between the ulna and the humerus okay. yeah yeah or is it more of a slider? It's a, uh, I think that the exact definition is a, um, um, the saddle, the saddle joint. And so basically it, it, it allows, you know, mostly, you know, flexion extension, but, you know, you have kind of other motions as well, like rotation. Like rotation. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not, it's not fully a ball and socket because you can't, you know, it's not the same range of motion as your shoulder. And so they classify it as a saddle, as a saddle joint, which is kind of so one step. Like ball and socket, like exactly. Like Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so the next set of bones are your carpals, right? And so these are the bones of your hand, right? And so these are basically your carpals right here. Right. right. And so it's actually a collection of, of different bones in there, right? Um, okay. And then from there, you have your metacarpals, which is, you know, kind of moving towards your fingers, right? And so your metacarpals are kind of the lower finger, the, your lower finger bones closer to your, closer to your hand, okay? And then the last of your bones here are your phalanges and your phalanges are, you know, the tips, the, uh, the bones at the ends of your, of your fingers. Okay. All right. And uh, those are all the the bones. And so, you know, I'll be I'll be referring to, you know, I'll, I'll try not to, you know, use these names without that much context, just because I know it's a lot of vocabulary. Um, but you know, these are these are the main bones that we're going to be talking about. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any questions on the uh, on the bones here? Okay. All right. So now let's talk about the the muscles. All right. And so, you know, the names of the muscles here are actually going to be pretty important because a lot of the static analysis that we're going to be covering, you know, has to do with computing how much force the muscle has to exert um, in certain situations, right? And so getting to know, you know, not only the names of these muscles, but also, you know, the types of motion that they allow or basically, you know, when they contract, you know, what kind of motion does that, does that drive in your upper extremity? Um, that's going to be really useful for us, you know, as we start to do calculations with these, these things, okay? And so let's go over all the different um, muscles that you have, and you know what types of motions that they're that they're um, um, that they're responsible for. Right? All right, so let's start at the shoulder. And so at the shoulder we have the deltoid muscle, right? And so your deltoid muscle is kind of it's almost like a um, almost like a spherical muscle that that kind of covers the top of your shoulder joint, right? And so the you know if you kind of trace out the muscle, it's kind of this muscle that's right here. I guess it kind of extends up a little bit more from from there. Okay? And so the, the deltoid, if you can imagine, you know, if the fiber is running this way, remember when a muscle contracts, you know, it kind of contracts, you know, along the, uh, along the fiber direction, right? And so one way that you can kind of model this is that, you know, if you kind of look at a figure like this, you see which way the fibers are running, you, should, you can take your hand and kind of pinch that, pinch that muscle to kind of um, simulate the fact that the fibers are getting shorter, okay? And so your deltoid, when it contracts, it kind of pulls your arm up like this, right? And so your deltoid is the main muscle that's responsible for shoulder abduction, right? And remember, abduction is um, basically the motion that pulls that pulls your limbs away from your body, right? And so when your deltoid contracts, it's going to pull your muscle up like this, right? 
And so if you wanted to work out your deltoids at the gym, you know, I think common, a common exercise is, you know, your shoulder raises like, like this, right? And that's, that's targeting that deltoid muscle specifically. Right? So you said it's good to have the abductions and that's something you do. Uh, it's mostly, it's mostly away from the body like this, but I think. How come you're in the plate with your body weight and stuff like when you do overhead movements, like they say that's the best way to hold your, your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Is that because this is also considered abduction too, or mm -hmm. what? Yeah, yeah. So if you if you kind of go like this, you know, if you notice kind of like your your shoulder is kind of pulling this way too, and so like this 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 is kind of I think pure abduction here. But when you kind of do overhead stuff too, then your shoulder is kind of becoming closer to your head too. Oh, okay. And so that's that's another way for the shoulder to abduct as well. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a bit hard to imagine just because the shoulder has such a wide range of motion, and so you know this is the same as doing this. And so they all kind of work with the delta the same way. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, question in the chat. You felt pain on your deltoid. Yeah, don't don't hurt yourself. <laughs> um, you know, fun, it's, it's it's fun to experiment, but uh, make sure you're you're always safe doing that. Right? Okay. Uh, next is your uh, your pec your pectoralis muscles. Okay. Um, and so the the one the main one that's visible is the pectoralis major, which is uh, kind of this big um, big muscle right here. Okay. So this is your pectoralis major, okay? Right, and so I, I didn't list out all the different pectoralis muscles because there, there's quite a few of them. And so I kind of grouped them all into just, just your pectoralis muscles in general, right? And so those are a lot of the muscles that are inside your chest, okay? Uh, and so what these are responsible for are adduction and medial rotation of your, of your arm, right? And so anything that kind of brings your arm kind of you know, closer to the, the midpoint of your body or anything that kind of rotates your arm towards the middle of your body, like this, um, that's what your pectoralis is, uh, is engaged, okay? All right. All right, and so next we have the uh, latissimus dorsi, which is, uh, which is not here, unfortunately. I couldn't find a good image that shows everything, okay? And so your latissimus dorsi is kind of your muscles that are kind of in your, in your back, right? And so um, I know this person is kind of facing the front, but your latissimus dorsi is kind of on your, on your back. Uh, and so what that's, this is kind of the, the opposing muscle from the, uh, from the pectoralis, right? So whereas your pectoralis will kind of rotate your arm towards the midpoint, and so you can kind of, you know, uh, rotate your arm like this, the muscle that opposes that, that rotates your arm back, that's going to be your, that's going to be your back muscle, the latissimus dorsi, right? And so the latissimus dorsi is, is responsible for other things as well, but, but, the, uh, but the, main, um, the main responsibility for your upper extremity is to basically, um, laterally rotate the arm, right? So you know, that's responsible for rotating your arm outwards. Yeah. Question in the chat? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so remember medial, uh, when, it, when, we, when we say medial, that means uh, rotating towards the, the midpoint of your body and lateral means rotating away from your body. So if you kind of, um, you know, stand in kind of the, the neutral position and you rotate it such that your palms are facing outwards, right? And so, you know, basically like, like this, it's a little bit hard to do on, on the webcam. And so that's lateral rotation. Right? And so look at the direction of your, of your palms as you rotate your arm. So that will tell you whether you're rotating laterally or outwards or medially or inwards. Right? You can kind of feel it in your muscles a little bit too as, as you engage. So, you know, when you rotate your palm inward, you can kind of feel that your, your pecs or your chest are, 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 are tensing up, right? And so as your, as your pecs are kind of are, are contracting like this, right? That naturally wants to pull kind of your arms and rotate them towards the towards the midpoint of your body, right? Whereas if you kind of pinch your your back muscle, right, right? and so that's going to want to kind of naturally pull your your hand to the to the outside. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit. I know I I can't even see the what I'm seeing on the camera right now, but you know it's it's you know um, just kind of practice. You know when whenever you see these kind of muscles right here, practice actually pinching it and see you know what kind of motion that creates in, in the other parts of, of your body. Okay, and so next are the, um, I think the muscles that um, a lot of us are familiar with, which is the biceps, okay? Um, and so there's, there's, quite, there's actually quite a few muscles in your upper arm, right? And so if, uh, first let's go over the biceps brachii, which is I think the, uh, the main one that people um, like to work out, okay? And so this is the main, one of the main muscles that's responsible for elbow flexion. And so you flex your elbow, that's your biceps brachii that are, that are doing a lot of that, that work, okay? 
Um, and so that's uh, and so I think this image here gives a good um, gives a good um, you know image of it. And so on the one end it attaches to your shoulder, but the main thing that it moves is your lower arm, which it which it attaches to right here, right. And so when this biceps um, contracts, right, and so it gets shorter, it's going to pull. It's going to pull the arm in this direction towards you know so that your elbow is in more flexion. It's just one of them, and so I believe um, it looks. I believe it's the the radius that is connected to, according to this image. But, um, but yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I'll, I'll double check that for, for next time. All right. Uh, next, we have the brachialis. Uh, with, this is another upper arm muscle. Okay, and so this is again responsible for elbow flexion, but when the hand is is pronated, right? And so when your hand is kind of facing downwards, okay. And so the um, the muscle that that uh, that flexes your elbow. Um, and that position is called the brachialis, okay? okay. Um, and then um, number six right here is the brachioradialis, okay? And so this is actually a muscle in your lower, uh, your lower forearm, so in this area, okay? And so this is, your, this is your main forearm muscle. So whenever you grip your hand, then your brachioradialis is the one that's, um, that's, that's acting on you, okay? And the last, uh, the last main muscle in the uh, in the upper arm is your triceps, which is on the back side of your the back side of your arm. Okay, and this is the opposing muscle um, for the biceps. Okay, and so when that, when the triceps uh, when the triceps um, contracts, it's going to extend your elbow. Right. So say kind of same exercise that we did before. So you know take take your other hand, put it on your tricep, and pinch it. Okay? And when you pinch it, you know you can kind of feel your arm kind of naturally want to extend. And so that's what your that's what the tricep um, that's what the tricep does. Okay. All right. And so uh, you know we we may not you know um, call these muscles by their names all the time, but it's important to kind of get familiar with you know when these when a muscle like this contracts, you know which direction is that force going to go, and where is it going to attach to on the arm? Right. And so that's those are the main um, you know those are the main qualities that we're going to be looking at. Right. And so later on, I think on, you know, starting on Wednesday, you know, we're going to do static analysis of, of, of systems like this, right? And so knowing, you know, a typical direction and typical, you know, where these, uh, these, muscle atta these muscles attach um, is going to help us out a lot to determine, you know, uh, what's reasonable, what's a reasonable attachment, you know, what's a reasonable direction for this, uh, for this force to act. Yeah, question. Uh, so for the triceps, uh, there's like three muscles back there, right? Yes. So do you know, I'm curious, what, uh, which motions activate what, like is one for extending, pronated, one for extending, supinated, and then one for, you know, doing something else? Or, you know? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, that I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I, you're, you are right that the tri and triceps refer to three, um, um, three, three main muscles, um, but I'm not sure which one is specifically um, responsible for which. I think, I think different ones have different attachment points too. And I think they uh, they don't all attach at the same place, and because of that, you can do kind of different things with the triceps depending on you know where the position of your wrist and things like that. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with you know the exact what exact three muscles they do. Okay, so they attach at different places. Does that mean they have different direction? Um, yeah, uh, um, potentially yes. And so um, you know, I think I think this image is kind of a little bit of a simplification. But I think you know you, you can have different attachment points on the on the shoulder side of the triceps, okay. and also different attachment points on the on the elbow side. And so you know I think I think some of the muscles might share the same attachment point on the elbow, maybe two or three of them. But then you can see here that you know on the on the shoulder side, they attach differently up, up here depending on which motion that they that they have. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions on uh, on muscles? All right, and so now let's go over the the joints, okay? And so there's four, five main joints here that's uh, um, that we talk about in the in the in the upper extremity, um, but we're mostly going to focus on I would say the elbow joint and the shoulder joint, um, you know, just because those those joints are a little bit simpler in terms of you know uh, what muscles act on. All right, so let's go over the shoulder joint first. Okay? And so the shoulder joint is the um, is the joint between the humerus and the scapula, okay? And so what you'll see a lot in the, uh, in the biological and anatomical literature is that the joints 
um, are named after the after the bones that comprise them. Right? And so, because the the shoulder joint is comprised of the humerus and the scapula, we call that the humeroscapular joint. Um, you know, and so it looks it looks like a, a long a long you know really long scary name, but if you kind of break it apart, you can kind of see that there's two that these are basically the two main bones that that comprise. And so just like we've talked about before, it's a, it's a ball and socket joint. Right? And so it's, it's formed between the head of the humerus and the, uh, and the cavity of the scapula, which is called the glenoid cavity, okay? Um, and because of its geometry, it allows for you know, complex multi-axis rotation of the arm, okay? And because this, uh, this, glenoid, this glenoid cavity of the scapula is, is so shallow, um, it's also subject to a lot of dislocations. Right? And so we talked about that a little bit uh, earlier. All right, next we have the elbow joint. And so the elbow joint is the joint between the humerus and the ulna. And so that's why we call it the humeral ulnar joint. Okay. Okay. And so this is mainly a hinge joint that's formed between the humerus and the ulna, right? And so that's responsible for elbow flexion and extension. Okay. All right. And so in a lot of our analysis, we're gonna focus mostly on these two joints, um, but you know, the other joints are also important there. Okay. Uh, and so the wrist, the wrist joint, um, the wrist joint is, is, and I don't have the name for it here for some reason. And so the wrist joint is formed between the radius and your hand bones. Okay? Um, and so the name probably like a radial carpal joint uh, or something, something along those lines, right? And so you can see we have the radius here kind of formed this nice flat edge, and then it forms a joint with all your carpal bones. Um, all right, and then we have the joints between the uh, between your fingers and the hand, right? And so that's all of these joints right here. Okay. Uh, and so those are called the trapezial metacarpal joints. Okay. And so these are satellite joints um, because they, you know, very similar to your wrist, they can kind of do you can do a lot of different things with your with your fingers. Okay. Right. Okay. And then finally, you have the joints that are between your fingers, right? And so these are talked about all of these guys right here, right? And so these are mostly hinge, hinge joints, okay? Because they, uh, your fingers can only kind of, you know, flex and flex and extend, right? But between your fingers and your hand, you can kind of do, um, you know, a little bit more complex motion. Uh, okay, uh, any questions on, uh, on the joints? Okay. All right. Okay, and so you know, starting next time, we're gonna we're gonna start to do um, you know uh, an analysis called static biomechanical analysis, right? Um, because now that we're kind of familiar with all the bones and the muscles of the upper extremity, we can actually start to do some quantitative analysis. On it, right? And so that's that's gonna be pretty exciting. Okay? Um, and so you know, when the upper extremity is exposed to external loads, okay? and so you know, some examples could be you know maybe you're holding something in your hand, or maybe you're pressing against a wall, okay? Um, and so when this happens, you know, your body is going to naturally want to maintain static equilibrium um, in these situations, right? And the way that it does this is that it's, uh, it causes the muscles to um, exert tension, okay? Um, and it also um, causes some, um, some reaction forces at your joints, right? Because overall, you know, your whole body and your whole joint has to be in, in static equilibrium, right? Um, and so the goal of, of static analysis um, that we'll see is that you know we're going to draw we're basically going to be drawing three body diagrams and so they're going to look very similar to you know what we have on, on this side of the screen okay and we're mostly concerned with uh with two main quantities right and so the first quantity that we that we're interested in is you know what kinds of forces um do our muscles need to exert in order to maintain equilibrium okay uh, and so we want to find out you know um if you know if we want to maintain equilibrium here how much force does the um, does the muscle have to exert okay uh, and then once we find that, we can also find the reaction forces at the joints, okay? And what that means that, you know, basically in addition to your muscles exerting force, your joints also have to um, basically exert some force too, right? So whether the joints are being compacted, more times than not, they're gonna be kind of compacted, um, compacted against each other, okay? Um, and so, you know, that compaction is gonna create some reaction forces that, you know, are, are also needed to maintain static equilibrium, okay? Um, you know, and the, and these are really important because, you know, once we know the muscle force and once we know the reaction forces, the joints, 
then we can start talking about you know how much work is the muscle doing, how much you know how much um, stress is the uh, is the joint undergoing, right? Um, and we can use this this basis of analysis to say that you know can we design devices that lessen this force, or maybe there's certain poses, or maybe there's certain motions that we can go through uh, for this action to reduce the stress at that. And so I think one interesting example that you'll see, um, you know, not this week, but next week is we'll look at, you know, um, I think, you know, whenever you're, whenever you're lifting something heavy off the ground, you know, the thing that, that everyone tells you to do is to lift with your legs and you don't lift with your back. And so we'll actually do an analysis of that to see, you know, how much more stress your, uh, um, your hip is going to be placed under when you lift with your back versus your, your neck. Okay? And so we're going to be doing a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of um, analyses like that. Uh, okay, uh, any final questions before we wrap up for today? Okay, All right. And so and so on Wednesday, we'll pick up we'll, we'll pick it up with the uh, uh, with the part B of the biomechanics notes, okay? And we'll start to do some calculations. Okay? And so thank you guys for tuning in today. Um, I'll have your midterms ready on Wednesday. And so if you want to come um, get it and see the and see the comments, you have to come to class, okay. Um, and I'll, and so have a great day and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Uh, it should be tomorrow morning because I, I have like five more to go. And so I'm, I'm basically almost done. And so you'll see, you'll see your raw score on Canvas. But if you want to see the comments and the feedback that I gave you, then that's, it's written on the physical. Yes. Yeah. Is that going to cause a surface area problem? Like, because I have that problem on the chair mm -hmm. where I accidentally selected faces instead of instead of just the whole object, like instead of the whole seat. So when I went to apply a pressure, um, I got a notification from ants that force. I, I got a, when I went to apply the force. Not Mm -hmm. So I got a notification from Hans talking about low surface area to volume ratio 